So thank you all for joining us uh, for our uh, third uh, virtual field trip. Um, this, uh, of course, you know, we had planned to, to visit uh, Fisk University and specifically Fisk University Library. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, of course, we weren't able to physically go there. So um, Robert Spinelli with uh, the Fisk University uh, Library and Special Collections has uh, joined us today and is going to kind of share a little bit about the university and the special collections. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to turn things over to him and we'll have time for some Q&A um, at the end of this. So Robert, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Robert Spinelli. I've been here at Fisk for almost a year now. Prior to that, I was the librarian at American Baptist College in North Nashville. Uh, so I'm glad to be here working in this department and we'll be taking you guys through some interesting information. And I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so hello. So, in 1865, barely six months after the end of the Civil War, and two years after the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation, three men, John Ogden, the Reverend Erastus Milo Cravath, and the Reverend Edward P. Smith, established the Fisk School in Nashville. The school was named in honor of Clinton B. Fisk of the Tennessee Freedmen Bureau, who provided the new institution with facilities in former Union Army barracks near the present site of the Nashville Union Station. So that's kind of in Midtown here in Nashville, if you are familiar with it. Um, but in these facilities, Fisk con convened its first classes on Jan January 9th, 1866. James Dallas Burris, John Houston Burris, Virginia Walker, and America Robinson were the first students to enroll at the university, and you can see them in the photo in the center there. In 1875, the first class graduated from Fisk and became the first African-American students to graduate from a liberal arts college south of the Mason-Dixon line. Also pictured here are the army barracks where the first incarnation of Fisk, Fisk University began. So very different from where things are now. So initially when Fisk started as a school, it was providing elementary education. And after serving that function for a while, Fisk began functioning as a normal school, a school that prepared its students for teaching. So that's normal with a capital N. Uh, the success of this program would come into evidence over the next several decades, as Fisk alumni became, became known throughout the South for starting their own schools and becoming community leaders. By 1869, the normal department had added a model school in which students taught for a half hour each day. Fisk also had a high school, a theology department, a commercial department for vocational training, and a college. Although a number of black colleges would add vocational courses to their curriculum in the late 1890s and early 1900s, uh, Fisk remained de dedicated primar primarily to liberal arts, even though there was a he heavy religious influence in the early days of Fisk University. Uh, W.E.B. Du, Bo du Bois, who had become known for promoting the intellectual versus vocational development of African Americans, graduated from Fisk in 1888. And you can see him seated on the left in this picture here, one of the few few photos of him that we have in our archives. So by 1871, the school was suffering from financial issues. In order to avert bankruptcy and closure, this treasurer and music director, George L. White, a white northern missionary dedicated to music and improving African Americans were the intellectual equals of whites, gathered a nine member student chorus consisting of four black men, Isaac Dickerson, Ben Holmes, Green Evans, and Thomas Rutling, and five black women, Ella Shepard, Maggie Porter, Minnie Tate, Jenny Jackson, and Eliza Walker, to go on tour to earn money for the university. So on October 6, 1871, the group of students consisting of two quartets and a pianist started their U.S. tour under White's direction. After a rough start, the first U.S. tour garnered approximately $40,000 for the school.
So in, after the success, success of the US tour, the original Jubilee singer left for a tour of Europe that would continue with a few gaps until 1878. Now, the, the tour in Europe was incredibly successful and raised approximately $150,000, which made it possible to create the first permanent structure on Fick's, Fick's new campus. Uh, also of note is that the, particularly the, Europe, the European tours of the Jubilee Singers, one of the things that they did, aside from performing and singing and making money, was to collect books. So they brought back books in their steamer trunks and chests that would be, become the foundation of this library. Uh, the first library was, was just a, a small section of shelves in the, one of the old army barracks buildings that will later move to Jubilee Hall and continue with the growth of the, of the college campus. So Jubilee Hall, as you can see in the background, is the oldest academic building on the new Fisk campus, the present site of the school. So using the funds uh, garnered by the, by the Jubilee Singers, it was completed in 1876 and was the university's first permanent building and is a good example of Gothic revival architecture. The, as I mentioned before, the, the first library was then moved to Jubilee Hall and placed into the into what's known as the Appleton Room. And after it was there, it outgrew that facility. It moved into the Carnegie, Carnegie Library, which you can see pictured in this in this image as well. In 1974, it was designated as a National Historic Landmark in recognition of the university's place as one of the first HBCUs to be established after the Civil War. As the university grew and changed, it began to attract a range of important African-American figures that bridged cultural movements like the Harlem Renaissance and academia. Arna Bontemps, famed author of the Harlem Renaissance between the Fisk and the early 1940s in the role of head librarian. He worked with Arturo Schoenberg, head of the Negro Society for Historical Research, to create a Negro collection that would honor African-American history and establish Fisk University as a prominent resource for research and scholarly creation. Beginning in 1928, Charles S. Johnson, uh, editor and writer, held positions at Fisk University as in various different capacities. He was the founder and director of the Fisk Social Science Center, chair of the Department of Social Sciences, and director of the Social Science Institute. From 1942 to 48, he served as the co-director of the Race, Race Relations Program for the Julius Rosenwald Fund and of the Race Relations Program for the American Missionary Association. And in 1947, he became the first African-American president of Fisk University. Uh, Charles Johnson's collection is one of the largest and most widely used that we have in our special collections. Uh, people from all over the country come to use his papers and there's a lot of a great wealth of material. Now from March 26th, 28th of 1958, the Nashville Christian Leadership Council held the first of many workshops on using nonviolent tactics to challenge seg segregation. These workshops were led by James Lawson, who had studied the principles of nonviolent resistance while working as a missionary in India. Later workshops were mainly attended by students from Fisk, uh, Tennessee A&I, which later became TSU, American Baptist Theological Seminary, which later became American Baptist College, and Meharry Medical College. <clears throat> Among those attending Lawson sessions were students who had become significant leaders in the civil rights movement. Among them, Marion Barry, James Bevel, Renard Lafayette, John Lewis, Diane Nash, and C.T. Vivian. But during, the, during these workshops, it was decided that the first target for the group's actions would be downtown lunch counters. At the time, African Americans were allowed to shop in downtown stores or were not allowed to eat in the store's restaurants. The group felt that the lunch counters were a good objective because they were highly visible, easily accessible, and provided a stark example of the injustices Black Southerners faced every day. In 1959, James Lawson and other members of the NCLC Projects Committee met with department store owners and asked them to voluntarily serve African Americans at their lunch counters. Both men declined, saying that they would lose more business than they would gain. 
the students then began doing reconnaissance for sit-in demonstrations. The first test took place at Harvey's apartment store in downtown Nashville on November 28th, followed by the Keen Sloan store on December 5th. Small groups of students purchased items at the stores and then sat at their counters and attempted to order food. Their goal is to try to sense the mood and degree of resistance of each store. James Lawson would go on to serve as president of Fisk University from 1967 to 75. He was the first alumnus to serve as president. Under, and under, under his leadership, Fisk saw its highest number of enrolled students. However, Fisk's predominantly white donor base had been declining since the 1960s before Lawson's presidency, when many students participated in nonviolent civil rights demonstrations. As many students joined or were influenced by the Black Power Movement during the late 50s, 60s, donor support dwindled further. So here's a shot of the, the present home of the library and the special collections reading room where we hold a lot of different presentations, exhibits, and this is it's the main research room where people come from external, external uh, institutions to work with archival materials. The special collections and archives of the John Hope and Aurelia E. Franklin Library at Fisk University contain some of the oldest and most definitive collections of African American history and culture. Since the establishment of the university in 1866, it has been the library's tradition to acquire materials by and about African Americans and people of the African diaspora. Uh, Louis Shores, a noted author and the school's first professional librarian, came to Fisk in 1928. He embarked on a plan to collect and preserve materials by and about African Americans and house them separately in the library. In 1929, Fisk enlisted the aid of foreign dealers to provide works for a special Negro collection. This effort resulted in the purchase of 28 pamphlets and manuscripts on the early history of Black domestic servants in Europe. By fall of 1930, Fisk hired Black bibliophile Arthur, Arthur Schomburg as curator of the collection. He was experienced and knowledgeable in the field and immediately began to build a collection similar to his own for Fisk. He acquired a number of unusual and, and retrospective works that otherwise might not have been gathered. By this time as well, Fisk, through an agreement with the Southern YMCA Graduate School in Nashville, concentrated on collecting works on Blacks outside the U.S. and dated prior to 1865, as well as appropriate materials on Blacks in this country since 1865. Arna Bontemps, writer of, of the Harlem Renaissance and Libra area and librarian, took over in 1943. Although his budgets were never generous, he was able to build the special collections even more by gathering the papers of such African-American luminaries as Charles Chestnut, Langston Hughes, John Mercer Langston, Scott Joplin, and W.E.B. Du Bois, and the archives of the, of, of the Julius Rosenwald Fund, including photographs of the school that Rosenwald built for Blacks in 15 Southern states. Bontemps also brought to his staff professionals who began to process the growing collection of manuscripts and archives and prepare finding aids for them. Increasingly, scholars began using the collections from master's and doctoral theses, books, articles, and films. Since this time, librarians such as Jesse Carney Smith, Anne Shockley, and Beth House, a uh, great granddaughter of Ella Shepard, have sought to increase the holdings of special collections through acquisitions of papers, hosting events and workshops, uh, creating an archive of oral histories, and expanding community, community awareness of Fisk University's significance through programming and cultural events. All things that we hope to start up and continue with as COVID dwindles and we can become more active in pursuing collection development again. So I'm going to show a few of our the highlights of our collection and discuss some of the uh, the paper archival collections that we have here. What you see here is the Lincoln Bible, which was presented to Abraham Lincoln by the colored people of Baltimore, Maryland. The Bible was given to Lincoln on July 4th, 1864 at the White House to show appreciation to Lincoln for his part in, in emancipation. The Bible was given to Fisk in April of 1916 by Lincoln's only surviving son, Robert Todd Lincoln. The Bible is large, it's a pulpit size, and is beautifully covered in purple velvet with gold embellishments on the front and sides. It's probably the centerpiece of our special collections area, and we keep it on permanent display in front of large pane glass windows so that people can see it as they walk by. 
when he was curator of the Negro collection at Fisk, Schoenberg learned about the Bible and found it in a glass safe in the barracks where first Fisk first was founded. Uh, at that point, it was taken out and cleaned up, and it was put on permanent display in the, in 19, in the 1970s, and is still loaned periodically to museums and exhibitions around the country. <clears throat> So one of the most used collections that we have is the collection of the Jubilee Singers. So we have a few, this one has a few different branches. The original collection, which revolves around <clears throat> the earliest days of, of the Jubilee Singers tours, the European tour, and a supplement which chronicles some of the later years. And we're also constantly working on gathering materials of relating to the modern contemporary Jubilee singers, which in some in some instances are harder to track down because people like to hold on to their materials. So researchers come from all over to look at these, these boxes. They document the various travels and experiences of group members and contains numerous pages of correspondence, pamphlets, programs, posters, news clippings, uh, everything you can think of. A lot of the material is in very fragile condition. So we try to digitize the most the most fragile works, and which also helps with making them accessible to people, obviously. So some highlights of the Jubilee Singers collection include the Diary of Ella, Diary of Ella Shepherd, as well as her Bible. Uh, Ella Shepherd's Bible recently was has some conservation work done and is currently on loan to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. We also have a lot of scrapbooks and autograph books, uh, awards, as you can see some picture here, the uh, Grammy they won this year, and uh, Medal of the Arts from, from recent years also. We also have a lot of archival audio recordings, some going back to the early days of the singers that we're working on getting digitized, and those would be very valuable once we actually have them available for people. And some of the other things we have we have an extensive archive of sheet music and the compositions that are widely used by researchers as well. And so what you see here is the parts of the Holy Bible selected for the use of Negro slaves it was published in 1807. The, the Bible omits specific parts of the, of the traditional whole Bible it omits any parts that discuss any notion of being against enslavement or that could possibly incite rebellion. So if you, when you look through this Bible, you can see very clearly all of the different sections that have been eliminated, um, any idea of uh, individuality or freedom or release from bondage are all taken out. So it's cut, it's a very small Bible it can cut down to only a few hundred pages. Specifically, the chapter of Exodus is almost completely omitted, given that the main theme of the chapter is God emancipating the enslaved Hebrews from the Egyptians. It's considered priceless, as there are only three known copies in the world, and the one that we have here is the only one in North America. I'm not sure, what, I know that one other copy is in England, and I'm not sure where the third copy is. So it's, we've taken very special care to have different versions of this. There's a, there was a mass market version you can buy on Amazon. So we have that in our library holdings, as well as a, a transcript and a digitized version that people can use instead of handling the original document, which we try to keep safely locked up in our vault. One of our, another one of our very widely used collections is the arch archives of the Julius Rosenwald Fund, which operated from 1928 to 48. Now there, uh, Julius Rosenwald was a philanthropist and he worked with Booker T. Washington starting with at the Tuskegee Institute to fund construction of schoolhouses dedicated to educating Southern African American children. At the time, obviously, there was not there were not many educational opportunities for these these kids who were often the uh, children of slaves who had been emancipated and so they didn't have very many opportunities. And this helped to give them They'll give them another another step on the way to becoming educated. Over 5,000 of these schools were established in the early 20th century, and you can see that spread on the map 
year, uh, ranging from up and around Virginia to all the way through down to Texas and Florida. So as the fund grew in about in about 19 early 1930s, they started to expand their their scope a bit, and they started to support teacher training. They invested in creating libraries for communities and contributed to the study of race relations and social sciences. They also established a fellowship program, uh, which awarded grants to hundreds of African American writers, educators, artists, and scholars, as well as encouraging Southern whites to learn about race, race relations. So some of the most important, there, there are a lot of famous people came through the fellows program, including Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and the artist Elizabeth Catlett. And a lot of these, a lot of these applications and materials we have on file here at this that are invaluable to people who are trying to learn about this time period and the development of these, this program and the specific figures who worked in it. Our collection contains over 150,000 items, ranging from correspondence and photographs of scrapbooks and application materials from those people seeking fellowships. We also operate the Rosenwald Fund online database and that contains thousands of images of schoolhouses and we have little index cards with information, basic historical information about the funds that were used to create the schoolhouses, the years and counties and states that they all came up, came up in. And we are constantly working to update the, the database and evolve it so that it can be more useful to people who are working remotely and can't spend the time to come to, to the university. <clears throat> All right, so what you see here are printing plates that were used to print the first editions of Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. So we have four or five gigantic wooden crates of these plates uh, that are incredibly heavy, but a very exciting piece of history to be able to hold and look at when, when working to understand these collections. So originally published in 1903, the book comp of compiled essays solidified his position as one of the highest regarded scholars on race and the black experience. The, this photo, you can see the plates, we, we had them in an exhibit here at the school. Uh, people have come to study and try to take imprints of the, of the plates in the past but we do try to avoid having them handled too much due to their very priceless nature. Um, <clears throat> when we received our, the, collect, the Du Bois collection, which I'll talk about in, another, in a minute, the plates were not actually part of that collection or that donation. They had to be, I believe the family had to fight to actually have them sent here. And there was some money spent to get them away from the publishers into our hands here at Fisk University. So the Du Bois collection contains 128 boxes of material spanning the author and educator's career. When he died, the family estate decided very particularly where, uh, where things went. The, we got a good, a large portion of his collection and papers and the rest of it, I believe, went to uh, Harvard. And so the collection is split, but we have a very sizable amount of it here. So we have papers covering his personal and professional correspondence, uh, financial accounts, travel records, and other assorted memoranda. So the, the, the bulk of our collection for Du Bois is a wide selection of lectures, speeches, plays, and other other works. It contains extensive documentation about his involvement with political and social organizations, including the NAACP, Pan-African Congress, and World Peace Organization. The collection also has a lot of unpublished works and research that was meant to be incorporated into future works, which unfortunately we have not seen come to fruition. So aside from the plates for the souls of black folk, which you just saw, our archives contain numerous back issues of the crisis, which he edited from 1910 to 1934. We have a, I don't think we have every single ed edition of the crisis, but we have a sizable collection here. Uh, additionally, we have <coughs> the 
the Du Bois World War I photograph collection. A part of the research and field work he did for his unpublished manuscript, uh, Black Man and the Winter World, includes 259 photographs and 18 panoramas of African American and French African soldiers from the 301st, 302nd, 72nd, and 97th infantries of World War I. They were all taken between 1917 and 18, documenting places and people who were involved in the wars at that time. And these photos were still uh, working to preserve and digitize so that they can be kept safe. This uh, sculpture that you see here is probably about four to five feet tall and is housed on the third floor of the library, uh, right very close to the actual entrance to our, our archival, archival storage, as well as the Aaron Douglas Art Gallery. And so it's something that you can see anytime you, set, you might want to come down to Fifth. Lastly, I wanted to, to talk about the Luby collection that we have. So he taught at Fisk from 1926 until sometime in the 1940s. And he was responsible for organizing the Kent College of Law, which was a school dedicated to training African Americans for law practice. His major involvement came in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement when he would defend, he defended students who had been arrested for their involvement with the sit-ins discussed earlier um, that were arranged to protest all the segregation laws and Jim Crow laws going on. In 1960, his home was bombed in reaction to the civil rights movement. However, he stayed active until his death in 1972. So we have a collection, of, a smaller collection for him of 439 items that detail his involvement with the civil rights movement through newspaper clippings, photographs, and articles. And we also have a number of his personal correspondence and awards. He's one of those figures that doesn't get talked about as much from the civil rights movement, but played a very important part in trying to keep everything uh, above board and staying involved behind the scenes. So, that is the overview I wanted to share with you today. I have my contact information there if you wish to get in touch at any point in the future. And now we can go on to questions, if anybody has questions. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I know I learned several things during that that I didn't know. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, you right. mentioned, uh, well, first, before I get to my question, uh, so any of the rest of you guys, if you want to just drop questions um, in the chat box or uh, we can take turns, if you want to like raise your hand, we can just unmute ourselves and, and ask questions since we're a small group. Um, I guess my first question, you've mentioned uh, efforts to digitize pieces in the collections. Is that uh, digitized uh, work available um, through the internet? Is that something that everyone can access or do you have to physically go to FISC to access that? So <clears throat> that's a good, that's a very good question. So digitization, obviously, as COVID has taught us and just the general move and libraries in general, um, digitization has become the big thrust for our department and the library here. We are currently working on digitizing our Fiskiana collection, which is Fisk related materials going back through to the foundation of the school. So that includes all of our publications, um, yearbooks, board reports, everything that you can imagine that is related to this that we have on campus. So the short answer is we are working on it. Um, right now we work a lot with researchers from remote locations and so we scan by request, but we don't have full collections scanned up at this time yet. Or, and that's one of our main purposes in trying to acquire grants is getting different collections put up online so that we can house them and share them with everybody. So if any of our teachers wanted to use materials in the collections, maybe things that you've mentioned in the course of presentation, they just need to maybe contact you to get uh, copies that they could use with their students? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we can, we're, we're happy to take care of any, anything that people would want for their students. And we've helped, we've helped researchers create uh, lesson plans and other shared materials for documentaries and other presentations, so definitely. 
Um, Karen had a question uh, since she was fascinated by the Jubilee Singers and wanted to know if they were all students and did they continue to sing and raise money for Fisk after they graduated? Uh, that's a good question also. Um, <clears throat> so I think that after they graduated, most of the singers went their own went their own ways. I know that after the European tours, <clears throat> several of the original singers stayed in Europe and had careers there. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, I know that now the the singers are, are very involved still with the school. They perform here at every opportunity they're given, but also do focus on touring and uh, per performing for audiences all over the place. So I'm not sure how many how many did stay involved with Fisk, but definitely a, a fair amount of them did. Have the Jubilee Singers been around continuously since they were founded, or has it been in bits and spurts? No, uh, they've been around continuously. Um, they've had a steady stream of different directors over the years, uh, from the beginning all the way to the present day. Uh, Ella, Shep Ella Shepard was a director for a while, as well as uh, James Myers and his wife, who took over after he died, and she, she was in charge of the singers for almost, almost 40 years. She was there for a long time, uh, <clears throat> leading them and continuing the tradition. I had a question. Um, before our talk, I was looking through the, you know, Franklin Library website uh, at some of the exhibits. And, you know, I've, I've always heard about the Rosenwald School Fund, but it was only today that I learned about the scholarship fund for scholars and artists um, to, you know, go places. Now, I, I, I was very impressed, of course, by the, the, the list of people who were included in that fellowship, but I was wondering uh, if you could repeat or kind of clarify what their connection was to Fisk. Like, was it that somebody at Fisk decided who won the scholarships? Did they, did these people who applied ever come to Fisk? I mean, what was the connection there? Because it seemed like a lot of these people were in the same circles, uh, intellectual circles um, in places like New York. And I was just wondering if, if you know, Nashville became kind of a satellite of that. So um, a lot of it was just through connections. Some of them definitely spent time at Fisk. But one of the reasons that we wound up with a lot of these kind of ancillary Renaissance, Harlem Renaissance collections was because of the involvement of Arna von Thoms as a librarian and okay. Schoenberg. And also, I didn't highlight it there in the talk, but Charles S. Johnson, uh, before he came to Fisk, was a editor and writer in New York and participated heavily in the Harlem Renaissance. So there were a lot of those connections going on all the time. And I think that is what led to the Rosenwald Fund giving us a significant portion of their archives. Okay, so the basically the connection is that the the archives came to Fisk afterwards, yeah. yes. um, but a lot of the people probably knew people here uh, and 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 back and forth um, because of like you said that's right the the connections of Bontemp and um, Schomburg and Johnson and others. Yeah, it, it is fascinating to see how it all came together and wound up being housed here. And I think it's something that isn't terribly widely known to. Yeah. Right, people don't, you know, you, you hear about all these Harlem Renaissance figures and you know that they obviously had connections to other places beyond just New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but I never really thought about their connections to Nashville so much um, because of Fisk and that just, I'm sure somebody has told that story somewhere and I'll have to get my hands on it and read more about it sometime. So Robert, this is Karen again. Um, I'm just fascinated by um, your talk. Thank you very much. I'm a library educator, so this was really interesting to me. But um, you mentioned um, that Fisk was 
um, one of the first HBCUs after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm not what what so comparatively, is it the oldest HBCU um, in terms of the others around the nation, or um, I, I'm not aware when others started and when was that. So let's see. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess I'm and, going to cheat, cheat. And then secondly, um, are there several HBCUs in um, Tennessee? I know in South Carolina um, we have several, but I, I'm not sure exactly when they started. Well, the oldest in the country is, is uh, Cheney in Pennsylvania. Okay. Which, which uh, opened in 1837. But Nashville itself has uh, four different HBCUs. So there's um, wow. there's Fisk, and then right near right across the street from us is Meharry Medical College, and CSU is not far from there either. And then across the river in North Nashville uh, is American Baptist College, which is where a lot of the some of the um, the workshops led by James Lawson were held, and a lot of the figures like John Lewis came through there and did bachelor's degrees and kind of got their first taste of these kinds of things before moving on to Fisk. Right. Uh, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, just to, again, uh, go back to something that you had said about the slave Bible. Mm -hmm. You said that there is an HTML version that's digitized that are available. Is that like available through the website or just, you know, we can just all buy our own copies off of Amazon or something. <laughs> I mean, Cause I'd love to read that. That's yeah, like, there, there is the, the copy on Amazon and, and honestly, you might even have it on DSU. It's called unbound or no, not unbound, um, unholy. Here, hold on. I, I'm going to show it to you. Hold on. <laughs> Okay. I bet that's something that students would just be blown away to hear about. Probably um, so. It, it's a, yeah, it would, it would, oh, look at that. No, I see. So, and we, the version that we have digital is on a hard drive. So I'm sure it's something we could share. Uh, with the rows. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating book. <laughs> So you so, mentioned, go ahead. sorry, um, you mentioned that Fisk was a normal school for a while teaching teachers. Mm -hmm. When did it expand to start having a wider um, course load, I guess? Um, let me see if I can find the exact year that happened. But it, it eventually it, it had to do with funding, I believe, that uh, the normal school wasn't really working out anymore, so that they can so they decided to focus on educating adults and working to become a full university. Uh, I, I can look into that. I don't have. I'm not sure what the exact year was that it ended, but it had to do with um, gaining focus and realizing that in order to kind of stay afloat, Fisk had to make sure that they were moving in one firm direction rather than being so split off and branched out as it was in the beginning. Okay, that makes sense. And speaking about staying afloat, I had never made that connection before between the rise in civil rights activity and the decline in white donations. Mm -hmm. Did those donations ever pick back up after like the Civil Rights Act or the assassination of MLK or? You know, I think it's an ongoing issue that has not fully recovered. Um, mm. Having worked also at American Baptist College here, I know that from that kind of, from that 1960s civil rights period onward until almost the 80s and 90s, they also had a lot of trouble uh, keeping their door just keeping their doors open, and so it was something that was not just felt by Fisk. Yeah. So they had to go through. I can see why that would be like a national backlash, mm -hmm. but I never. I guess I had never thought about that before. Um, but I, I had heard like in recent years about Fisk selling or 
did they sell the Stiglitz collection or to the what's 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 the name of that art museum that the Walmart people have? Crystal. No, that's that's how they it. I'm sorry. No, I was thinking of the Museum of the Bible because that's run by Hobby Lobby owners. Oh no no, no. that's that's something yes. else. Yes. Um, but the the George O'Keefe Stieglitz collection or something? Yes, uh, we still have that here actually. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, it has not been sold off. Maybe okay, fourth great. Portions of it might have been sold, but we still have a significant quantity. Yes, I I know it was a long time ago that we were able to take a teacher group, you know, to the art museum there, um, in a lovely little building on campus, and it was. Oh, we wish we could be doing that in person, but <laughs> alas, I, uh, we can say that all we want and it still doesn't change things, but uh, but they do have a really nice little art museum there. Yes. And when I say little, I don't mean like little as in little insignificance. It's got amazing stuff and just amazing. Yes, definitely. So one of the questions that I had, uh, you mentioned that when the Jubilee Singers were doing their European tour, that they were essentially like collecting books uh, that they brought back with them. Was mm -hmm. that, uh, do you know if, if those books, was there like a specific focus and theme? Was that something they were purchasing or were they like gifted those books? I think it was a combination of, it was, I think there were mostly gifts and donations. Um, I don't know enough about it, the specific collections that they brought over to know if there was a theme. I'm thinking my, my imagination would be that they were trying to get as broad a range of materials as possible to bring back, but. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. I, I had not heard that before. So that was, that was interesting. Honestly, it's one thing that I, I had not known about either until I read Dr. Owen's doctoral thesis. And he, he mentions a lot about how the library, it's interesting to see how the growth of the university was in many ways kind of driven by the library and just the physical need to hold more books. <laughs> and so when they would get to that point, they said, okay, we have to build another building and so on and so forth, the campus grew. Do you know now which books were some of the original ones and the, which ones they got on the tours? <laughs> uh, not off the top of my head, but I'm sure I could. We have, we do have a, a vault of very fragile historical materials here in the special collection. And that's where all of our oldest and most rare special first editions of books and things like that are kept. What is your favorite item in your collection? Hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of really great, really great items that we have in the collection. I would say for <clears throat> the kind of stark uh, the stark reality of the, our collection. One of the things that we have that's most interesting are an actual set of slave shackles that were, was that was used um, during slavery. That's a pretty uh, risky item to look at, but it's interesting and just to see that material reality brought into play. We also have a number of death masks from certain figures, African-American figures that I, I want to do more research on and learn about their history. And we have a fairly large collection of original documents, plays, and advertisements from minstrel shows in the 1920s and 30s. So these things are all kind of, they're all very you know, ugly parts of history, but I think they're valuable for that reason. I have a question about the Floyd Bible. Mm -hmm. um, we were actually just doing this yesterday in my class. We were talking about um, spirituals and, and they had to find primary sources to match spirituals and stuff. And they were asking me about a Bible. You know, did they give um, slaves Bibles? And so I, I actually had no idea that that existed. Um, do you know, but like in my head, it was slaves weren't allowed to read. So why would they give them a Bible? Um, so at what point do they give them this Bible? And, you know, if, if they're not supposed to know how to read, then why give them one at all? I don't, I don't even know what I'm trying to ask, but it's. No, that's, that's, I mean, that's a great question. I know where you're going. And 
I'm not, I'm not sure if the, the Bibles were actually given to the slaves because most of them probably were illiterate and couldn't read it anyway. But it's it's I feel like it's more likely that these were just this edition of the Bible was just what the the owners had and what they would share with them if they wanted to be exposed to the Bible in some way. It's almost more. Oh, that's like that's an interesting thought because then it's more like teaching the the slaveholders the right things to say to mm -hmm. make sure that all the slaves are hearing the same edited version um so you don't have anybody spilling the beans on right. the exodus <laughs> or something yeah i mean it's a it's a means of control so that's what it's all about that kind of goes back to uh we did a, a presentation this summer on the second great awakening and i found this uh this trial this current transcript where this guy who was a Methodist, he was a Methodist preacher. Uh, he was brought up on charges that he was essentially inciting, um, you know, slave insurrection because he, uh, you know, he was preaching and, and, and mentioned, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, about you know, freedom and equality and the way that people were like treating their slaves and, mm -hmm. and they, they tried him for it. Um, and so that's, you know, an interesting um, piece to bring in is again, like, you know, the control that was being exerted on, on what people were hearing and, and religious services. I feel like I read about the same preacher and I, I can't remember the name. One of my main research interests research interest is in uh, cults and conspiracy theories. And I, I feel like I've hit on this person before that you're talking about and I can't remember who it is. I'll have to look it up real quick. Um, <laughs> so any other questions while I'm, I'm searching real quick in our, our newsletters from the summer? Yeah, one, one real quick um, question. I like how you responded to Anna's questions about what you like in the collection. Um, the picture of the, um, I, I'm just fascinated by Jubilee Singers, as you can tell, but that picture um, that the Queen um, had done of them, is that in your collection or did you take a picture of someone had that from Europe? So um, that, that picture was actually included in the presentation, which by the way, I'm happy to share if anybody wants to have a copy of it. Um, and the original painting is here in Jubilee Hall, it's on the wall and is a permanent fixture. I know we've had requests for loans, but I think that one's not going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, when you when you said they raised one hundred and fifty thousand dollars back in the day, I would, I would love to know what that would equate to now. But that's just jaw right. dropping to me. <laughs> so I guess the Europeans were just totally fascinated with, um, you know, the the gospel singing and, and that type of thing. Is there much written about that and the reactions of the crowds or anything? Uh, probably not about the reactions of the crowds, but, but there there is definitely a lot of information and probably books out there about, well, there's, definitely, there's several books about the Jubilee Singers history. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that has been mentioned in those. The, uh, mm -hmm. the historically dubious anecdote that gets shared a lot is that Queen Victoria was so impressed with the Jubilee Singers that she made a declaration that they must have come from some kind of music city. And so that's how Nashville got its name. Really? Wow. I mean, nobody can really verify if that's real or not, but that's one of the, the little anecdotes that's out there, yes. That's great. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. So that pastor's name was Jacob Gruber. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Robert, for, for taking time to present to our group uh, and for sharing this with us. And of course, uh, most of our group will be watching the recording of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be in touch with you. Of course, we have questions and folks who might be looking for sources to use um, in their lesson plans uh, going forward. Um, sure. One other quick question, would you mind sharing a copy of your PowerPoint with us so uh, folks can look at those images a little more closely than maybe what will show up in the recording? Certainly, I'll, I'll email that to you, Kara. All right, you thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. It was great coming. Thank you for having me over. All right. So with okay. that, I'm going to conclude or stop our recording.